So I'm not here um, advocating we should put implantable loop recorders in people with POTS, but um, this came from, I think, a discussion Leslie and I had had a little while back around implantable loop recorders in our patients with POTS. So I thought I'd share um, some, some thoughts um, and some of the evidence with you and um, maybe generate a little bit of discussion. Implantable loop recorders, are the, if you didn't know, are the, are the small devices that we implant under the left sternal edge. And we look for that and we implant those looking for significant heart rhythm disturbances. So either for um, you know, people who are at high risk of sudden cardiac death, people who were was highly suspicious that they've got um, really slow underlying heart rhythms, um, high-grade AV blocks that might require pacemakers, people that have um, syncope or passing out of um, a, an unknown cause. And certainly that's revolutionized. We shouldn't underestimate how that's revolutionized our management of syncope. Um, the ESC guidelines, if we take a step back, on the management of syncope, and we know why it's important for, in people with POTS is that about a third or so of people with POTS will have episodes where they black out or faint. So it's important that we think about the guidelines of syncope and how we apply that in a POTS population. So the 2018 ESC guidelines um, uh, actually have their recommendations in terms of who should get implantable loop recorders. Um, so they go through the normal things about the um, risk of sudden cardiac death and people with um, high-grade blocks. Um, and, who should, and what sort of things we should look at in the history. And the most important thing in there, in those ESC guidelines, even though we've got all the technology and everything, and anybody that runs a syncope unit or syncope clinic will always attest to the importance of a good clinical history and being able to elicit that prodrome and that symptom of prodrome out of people. I think Luana put it very nicely earlier when she was talking about the um, integration between mind and body and being aware of what you feel in your body. Um, and, also, and people not necessarily recognizing symptoms of when they're you know, about to, to pass out or faint. So in the ESC guidelines, when they're talking about syncope um, and in, in the context of reflex syncope, what the, statement, what the guidelines recommend is that ILR should be considered in patients with suspected or certain reflex syncope presenting with frequent or severe syncopal episodes. And that's a 2A recommendation. Um, it all should also be noted in the guidelines that they recommend that it should generally be more considered in someone who's older rather than younger. And in, under the, in people under the age of 40, those with no prodrome or very short prodrome should be considered for ILRs. And we must remember as well that implantable loop recorders, for all of the technology that we have, they don't measure blood pressure. In terms of POTS patients, we've got a, um, a nice publication that came out last year from um, the Toledo group, and so um, Blair Grubb's group, and they did a very nice, there's no other evidence out there around implantable loop recorders in people with POTS, and they did a retrospective study of 400 in people with POTS and syncope. So they looked back in their notes over 14 years. And they found 39 people, they were 85% women, and they were aged between the ages of 20 to 46, who had had what they described as severe syncope. So severe syncope was defined as four episodes of syncope in the last six months. And these people had ILRs implanted, and out of the 39 patients, 27 had prolonged asystole, and that was defined as greater than six seconds, um, or severe bradycardia. 15 had a systole of greater than 10 seconds was associated with prolonged convulsive syncope and was um, said to be without warning. Um, and all of those patients, patients, all of those 27 had, um, uh, had pacemakers. And syncope was reported in the study to have been eliminated um, in all of those patients. However, they continued to have POTS symptoms, so they continued to have tachycardia and they continued to have dizziness. So I think what I'd like to share with you is a couple of stories that we have from our own clinical practice, if you take that and think about that in consideration. So the first one is a young girl who's 28 years of age, and we run, we actually run a nurse-led syncope clinic, um, but this young woman didn't come through our nurse-led syncope clinic, she came through one of our general clinics, and she came in and she said she didn't get any prodrome, she had no warning, she just passed out, she just fainted. Um, and so she was listed straight from that clinic, busy cardiology clinic, um, for an implantable loop recorder. 
And not long after she had an impl the implant, um, she had an episode of syncope without warning. Um, and that was her um, tracing from the, from the implantable loop recorder. And that tracing shows a significant and is quite a prolonged um, slowing down of her heart rate, asystole. Um, so she was then seen by one of our registrars who, who put her on a list for a pacemaker. And the next thing we knew is she actually popped up into one of my colleagues' clinics that run the syncope clinic. And she came up to said, oh my God, Helen, we've got a 28-year-old girl who's passed out and fainted. And we're about to, well, I've just seen her to put a pacemaker in her. And so, oh my God, what are we going to do about this? This needs to be reviewed by a consultant. <laughs> So we very quickly, we, we got a bit of gleaned the history from her. And also because somebody else had said this woman should have a pacemaker, we actually got our expert in syncope to see the patient alongside us. And what it actually turned out was the episode of syncope was associated with having blood taken. And she had, and so if you look at the guidelines and the ESC guidelines, they talk about having the three, pre, three Ps, and one of them is prodrome. And actually, the other one is, is certain provoking factors. And in fact, when you went through the woman's history properly and accurately and took the time for it, she, in fact, had a number of provoking factors for syncope. And then actually, with properly talking through with her, she did actually experience prodromal symptoms. So our decision locally was that this young woman did not need a pacemaker. The, um, the other interesting thing that we did do, before I move on to the second story, is that Within our, within our unit, we did a little piece of work this year where we took the implantable loop recorders that had been done at our center and we cheekily divided them in between those that had come through the nurse-led syncope clinic and had, of course, we worked very closely with our clinicians as well um, and also those that had not come through the syncope clinic and had an ILR implanted. And in fact, the conversion rate or the rate of pickup for heart rhythm disturbances was higher, was 38% from our syncope clinic and about 31% from other um, referral sources. And if you also looked at our data, in fact, we were less likely to put implantable loop recorders in people that were young. We were more likely to put them in older people then, in fact, people, so if when you looked at them that came from other sources, there was a much young, uh, on average, I think the, the patients were about 40, 41 years of age. So I think that emphasizes the importance of a good history taken. So the last story I'll share with you is a delightful young woman that came to see me. Um, she had, um, she in fact had POTS diagnosed many years ago as a teenager. She was 21 years of age. She'd been referred to our center because she just had her first baby. Um, and our um, uh, consultant cardiologist uh, who has an interest in obstetrics said, Helen, would you please see and re reintroduce some medications now she's had the baby. So that said, that's great. Um, and we had a lovely discussion and she was so lively and she had an implantable loop recorder. And at the DGH, they decided that because she had palpitations that we should be looking at the palpitations and putting an implantable loop recorder in. And what she said to me is, this thing's absolutely driving me bonkers. And the reason it's driving me bonkers is because I'm getting all these calls all the time. And they said, do you know your heart rate is fast? And then they say to me things like, do you know I'm going to refer you to a specialist because I think you need to have ablations because your heart rate is going really fast. And she's thinking, I've got POTS. Of course it's going fast. <laughs> And what she actually said to me was that um, in the middle of the night, um, if she's having sex with her husband, the next day her husband has banned her from answering the phone. The reason he's banned her from answering the phone the morning after is that because she always gets a call from the cardiac physiologist saying, <laughs> did you know you had a high heart rate last night? <laughs> um, and I'll end on that. Thank you.